Hi, welcome to New Hope Community Church Online. The sermon you are about to hear was originally given by Pastor Chuck Wilson. New Hope Community Church, to know, to live, and to share Jesus Christ. The title for today is Love and Other Drugs. Love and Other Drugs, Joshua 16 and 17. Now, I know there's a movie with this name, which was with this title, which kind of gave me the idea. I didn't watch it. I don't plan to. Uh, I don't think it's a very Christian movie. But anyway, we won't go there. But the title gets it right. I, I like the title. It gets it right. The world's version of love is, is like a drug. The world's version of love, the sex without love, sex without marriage, um, is like a drug. It's deceptive. It's destructive. And it's actually a very good picture of all sin, love and other drugs. It's a good picture of all sin. What is sin? Something that God doesn't want us to do. Uh, why, though? Most people think, well, God doesn't want us to have any fun. He's this guy who's out there trying to spoil all our fun and take something we can't have or do because he's trying to spoil all our fun. But no, the Bible calls certain behaviors sin wrong because God warns us to stay away from them. Not because he's trying to ruin our fun, but because he wants us to have the ultimate fun. Because the, like a loving parent, which he is, God our Heavenly Father, he knows what seems like fun can actually hurt us. It's like our, we have little baby Laurel living with us, as you know. And Laurel loves the road. For some t- reason, she wants to run out into that road because it looks like fun but if I let her run out into the road what would happen it'd be fun for a little bit until a car comes along and then it wouldn't be so much fun anymore right and isn't that is a picture of why God tells us not to sin not to do certain things whatever in God's word he says stay away from there's a reason for it and the older we get the more we realize how wise God's word is right a lot of times we get our hands burned or we we you know singe and we go through it all and we're like why didn't I listen to God's word why didn't I listen to my godly parents they were just trying to help me by following God's word and that's really what that's why God warns us to stay away from sinful behavior which we're going to see here in the book of Joshua today Israel is taking a promised land in the book of Joshua. We've been talking about this for a while now, as you know. And it's, it's all about our spiritual battles. It's a physical battle, but it's really a picture of our spiritual battle. And they were commanded to take the lamb. They were promised success. They saw miraculous victory after miraculous victory, right? The walls come tumbling down. It's just amazing, right? So now we're going to read that they lived happily ever after, right? Uh, wrong, they experienced an incomplete victory and even many defeats, as we're going to see. Why? What went, what went wrong? The answers may hit close to home for some of us. So uh, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word, and we thank you for the warnings, and we thank you that you want what's best for us. You want what's best for us. We pray that your spirit would move in our hearts, in our lives now, through your word, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so what went wrong? The answers may hit very close here. Now remember, we're looking at the tribes getting their inheritance. That's what we've been looking at. And we, we, they've, they're getting their inheritance in the promised land, just like we have an inheritance. It's all a picture of us. We well, see they've already crossed the Jordan. They've already seen the walls of Jericho fall down. They've won many battles, which is a picture of our salvation, right? And the strongholds that have been broken for us as we be, when we became a Christian and as we start to grow. And now it's time to claim their full inheritance. It's time to claim their full inheritance, which, which is all that God promised them. And once again, this is a picture of our spiritual growth. It's a picture of our, of our sanctification, Sanctification, becoming like Jesus, becoming holy like him. It's about all about the spiritual growth. So this is, this is for us, all right? But we're going to see today that the Israelites hit some spiritual obstacles with the names of Canaanites. They ran into some Canaanites. They, Canaanites who lived in the land are a picture of sin. It's a type of sin, a picture of sin for us. They, in the Old Testament, picture of a New Testament 
uh, a reality which is sin for us. And they were told to get rid of the Canaanites, just as, as we're told to get rid of sin in our life, right? Same thing, same thing. So, in fact, in Numbers 33, which we've read several times, but I'm going to read it to you again. In Numbers 33, verse 51, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you cross the Jordan into Canaan, drive out all the inhabitants of the land before you, destroy all their carved images and their cast idols, and demolish all their high places. What was the common word in all three of those? All. All right. Uh, take possession of the land and settle in it, for I've given you land to, to, to possess. But, verse 55, but if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land, those you allow to remain will become barbs in your eyes and thorns in your sides. They will give trouble in the land where you will live, and then I will do to you what I plan to do to them. Whew. He warned them, very clear, get rid of them, and he warned them if you allow them to remain, the, idol the idolatry, the idols, the false gods that they worship, you will be enticed to worship and you will turn to them, and they will turn your hearts against God, which is exactly what we see many times throughout the Old Testament, right? Now, we already, we already saw, they were supposed to drive out the Canaanites, but we already saw several reasons why they did not drive them out in the book of Joshua. We've already seen several reasons why they didn't here, okay? The first one that we looked at was the Gibeonite deception, Remember, they were deceived by the Gibeonites, just as we are deceived by sin, right? Many times we're, we taught, went through that whole thing, deceived by sin. Then we saw that they started marrying the Canaanites in her marriage, which is a picture of falling in love with sin. And there are certain sins that we fall in love with. Remember those? Remember we dealt with that? Now we come to another key mistake. Not just deceiving, not just falling in love with sin, but we come to another key mistake. We're going to look at one more next week. Don't miss next week. But another key mistake they made with the Canaanites is something that the same thing that we often do with sin ourselves. Joshua 16 verse 10. They did not dislodge the Canaanites living in Gezer. To this day, the Canaanites live among the people of Ephraim, but they are required to do false labor. Hmm. We see it again. Chapter 17, verse 12. Yet the Manassites were not able to occupy these towns, for the Canaanites were determined to live in that region. However, when the Israelites grew stronger, they subjected the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not drive them out completely. Hmm. Is this crazy or what? What did, what did, what did they do? In addition to being deceived and falling in love, what did they do here? What's that? They disobeyed, and what did they do with sin? They tried, they, they tried to make sin pay. They try to make it pay off. Do you ever do that? We, we try to, we put sin to work for us. <laughs> we keep it, but we put it to work for us. The, now, um, a key here, a key here is the Canaanites we, were determined to live in the land. We see that here in verse 12, right? They're determined. They put up a fight. You have any sins in your life that put up a fight? You know, when you become a Christian, certain things are poof, gone, right? But other ones put up a fight. They're determined to stay, and it's a long, brutal battle. With the Canaanites are just like us. It's a long, brutal battle. They put up, sin puts up a fight. It, certain sins just won't let go. What, what reminded me of this, this reminded me of um, wolverines. Any, anybody ever seen a wolverine? You've seen one? Wow, how scary, huh? They're scary. Wolverines. Uh, wolverines are this little vicious animal. But they kill really big animals. In fact, they love to hunt moose and kill moose. And you say, how could this little vicious animal kill a moose? Well, because they never give up. They start tracking a moose, and they start hunting it down. They do it with everything, right? They do it with everything, and they just, this little vicious animal just stays on the trail. And they can run on top of the snow. The moose is breaking through the snow. They can run on top of the snow, and they just don't stop. And they get the moose scared and they get him running and the moose literally just runs himself to exhaustion and they just don't stop it doesn't matter how long that moose goes once a wolverine gets on the scent of an animal it never stops 
And it run, literally runs the moose into the ground. It drops from exhaustion. Then it goes for the throat and kills it. This little wolf, vicious animal does that. And that is a picture of certain sins in our life, isn't it? We think they're gone. We think we've thrown them off the trail. We think it's been years since I've had a problem with that. And we let down our guard. We stop running. <laughs> we take a little break. By the throat, right? Where did this come from? We can never take a break. We can never quit <laughs> fighting, fighting that sin, right? Now, the Israelites ran into this problem. These, these Canaanites were determined to live there. They were having trouble. So they tried to coexist with the Canaanites, which is really coexisting with sin. They, it's, they're, think, it's hard to beat certain sins, so we put them to work. How could they do that? Isn't that crazy? But how often do we do the same thing? There are many ways that we try to make sin pay. You probably are connecting some dots right now in your heads. Cheating. Cheating pays off. It's a sin. It pays off because we get better grades or we win in a game or we win something because of cheating. Lying. It pays off because we, we get out of trouble for now. Short term, right? Stealing. Stealing pays off because we get something we want. And there's lots of ways to steal. Stealing on our tax, cheating on our taxes is, is, is stealing. Speeding. We, we get somewhere we want to get to faster. Steroids or PEDS, right? With athletes, they, they use these, these performance enhancing drugs and it's a very, very, very common, believe me. But it pays off because the person plays better or they, they get to play longer. They get to succeed a lot longer. But it hurts the game and ultimately it hurts the person. There are consequences for using steroids. And sin does pay. Sin does pay, doesn't it? But only if for a short time. It always costs more than it gives. And the older you get, the more you know what I'm talking about. It always pays short dividends. Numbers 23, 32 says, at the, in the second part of that verse, it says, and you may be sure that your sin will find you out. That's why it's got to be confessed. That's why we have to repent, because if we don't, you may be sure that your sin will find you out. Just ask Bill Cosby, right? What a tragic, tragic story. Tragic story. We think we are getting something good from sin, but really it's destroying us. That's what it's really doing to us. Drugs are a great example. Drugs are a great picture of what I'm talking about. It's a sinful activity, but it's a, gr a picture of what we, we, we think we're getting something from it. And we are getting something, but it's short term. It's really destructive. It's destructive. We use the drugs and, and, and over time it's going to hurt us, damage us, and kill us. That's a picture, of easy picture, a vivid picture of sin. And we, we turn to sin to meet a need, a felt need. Not real needs, but felt needs is why we turn to sin. And it's temporary and it's empty. That's what sin is. We turn to it to meet a need, but it's temporary and it's empty. And I've said this many times. Sin promises thrills, never fulfills, ultimately kills. That's what it does. Promises thrills, never truly fulfills, ultimately kills. That's what all sin does. And, and we think we're going to get something out of it. And we, we try and, and it's, it's going to kill us. It's going to kill us. When I was, uh, I, may, I may have told this a while back, when I was in California, I did an internship with uh, a, a Christian camp, but it was a really rough camp for emotionally disturbed delinquents. These were the kids who couldn't stay in school. They, they were in big trouble, and they'd send them to this camp, and, and we would try to keep them out of trouble long enough to get some kind of a degree and I did an internship there right near San Diego and my job was I was just senior in college my job was to a lot of different things but one of the things was I was supposed to wear the kids out 
keep them good and tired, these boys, you know? And, and uh, that was my job. And so I would take them on hikes all over, all over the hills of Ramona. You know, all these, you know, North, you know what I'm talking about? No Ramona there. And there's beautiful, beautiful hills and had all these great places. I would take them on these hikes. And at one time I was getting ready to leave, go back home. And they asked me to train one of the new staff people. And they said, take them on, take, show them how you wear these kids out and how you, you know, interact with them and all that. And I said, okay, follow me. And, and I took about, we had about seven of these boys and had this guy helping. And I'm taking them and I'm teaching them and showing them, we take this trail and this trail and this is what we do. Don't let them go up on those rocks. Don't let them go into that, that, that cave. They got stuck in there one time, you know, all those crazy things that happened out there. Uh, but <laughs> this was the craziest. Uh, one, but these boys were not afraid of snakes. They would keep little baby rattlesnakes. And, and I'd be like, get rid of that. Get it out of the house. Because I had a group home. And, and I'd get that out of the house. And they'd go, oh, it's, it's harmless. It's just a little baby. Look at it gnaw on their fingers. See, it can't hurt you. It's just a baby. So they, they had these snakes. And they had snake skins and rattles. And I was always trying to buy one. They would never sell me their, their little snake skin or rattles. They kept them for themselves. So we're out walking. And they see a giant rattlesnake. Now, if you're from California, you know what I'm talking about. There's snakes here, and then there's snakes there, you know? And they, this thing was massive, you know, just a big, fat rattlesnake sitting there sunning himself. And they're like, there's this rattlesnake. Let's kill it. Let's kill it. And I, I was training my guy. No, no, boys, stay back. Let's just keep on walking, you know? And they're like, no, please, let us kill it. Let us kill it. We can kill it. I know we can do it. I'm like, no, no, this, this is too dangerous. Let's keep going. And, and they're like, we'll let you have the rattle. I'd been waiting the whole time for a snake, a rattlesnake rattle. There's no rattlesnakes where I'm from. This would be great. Uh, uh, I, come on, we'll let you have the rattle. What's your? And this was a giant rattle, you know. It was a big rattlesnake. I'm like, well, maybe we could give it a try. You know, okay, all right, guys, go, let's, let's kill it. So these guys, they, they're, they're like, and I'm thinking they're all professional snake hunters. You know, they got all these rattles and sins. Well, this was a big snake. They all start chasing it with sticks and rocks, and they're all chasing it, and the snake's taking off, and we go running after it, and all of a sudden, we're like, where's the snake? Because we had w w walked into like a field where there's a bunch of weeds, high weeds and grass. And also, we're all sitting there with rocks and sticks, and, and, they're, and then they're like, we got it. And also, nobody knew where it was. And we're like, where's the snake? Anybody see a snake? Nobody knew where the snake We're in this high weeds with this huge rattlesnake, right? And, and all of a sudden, we hear this rattle. It was right in the middle. It's this big rattle, and everybody jumped, and there was like a, a, like a rock behind me about seven feet high, slanted. And we all, I said, get on the rock. You know, we all jumped on the rock. We were all scrambling to the top, and we are hanging on to the, you know, the top guy was on the top, hanging, and we're all like hanging up there, and we're like, you know, we're all scared. It was scary. It was scary. And, 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 and we're like, where is it? Where is it? And there's weeds all We couldn't see it. And we're like all looking. And he had actually followed us to the rock. All of a sudden you hear this rattle right at the base of the rock. He was sitting there. You know, and we, and we all jumped. And when we jumped, the guy at the top bumped the guy in front of him, bumped the guy in front of him. We all started sliding down the face of the rock. And uh, right into the snake. And uh, the top guy was holding on. And I reached out and grabbed one of the kids. He was just sliding down into the... I grabbed all of them. I pulled them back up. We just held there. Don't anybody move. Don't anybody move. The hunters had become the hunted. And we're just sitting there. We're just sitting there on the rock. And we see them start to slither away. And they're like... I'm like, don't get down. Just wait. We're just waiting, 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 making sure he was really gone. Then we got him. We ran, you know. And, and I, I said, and that's what you never do. I said to the guy I'm training, that's what you never do with boys. I just wanted you to see that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he wasn't amused. But what were we doing? We thought we could get us a rattle. But what did this thing almost do? It almost killed us. Isn't that a picture of sin? We think we're going to get something out of it. We try to make it pay off. And, it, and it, sooner or later, we get bit. We get bit sooner or later. And we, we, that's what we often do with sin. How about us? What sin are we trying to squeeze something good out of, but it's really going to squeeze us? What, what in our life? 
That's why I use the title, why, Love and Other Drugs. Why do people use drugs? It's an easy example, a vivid picture. Why do people use drugs? Even though it makes them delusional, even though it destroys them, why do people use drugs? Because of, of how we feel when we use drugs. Because it makes us feel good for a while. Young people start out using it recreationally and at first, but then it becomes a dominating addiction. Because, but, but how does it start? Because it feels good at first, right? At first. Adults. Adults too. How do, how do adults get hooked? Usually through a prescription. They start taking a prescription, but then that prescription because of an addiction or they misuse other people's drugs. It happens all over our community. I deal with it a lot. They're using other people's drugs. And, uh, what, why? Why? Because it meets a need. Initially it was a pain, but why do they keep using it? Because it meets a need. They're down or we're stressed out. And so we take that drug that we should not be still taking. We take it because it meets a need. For every age, we'll use alcohol. Alcohol is a huge problem. Alcohol is more from this gift to be used at a wedding or a special occasion. That's what it was meant for. It was a special occasion from God. But now it's, now it's morphed into something that we in America depend on weekly or daily. That's not what alcohol was ever meant for. That's not why God gave wine, the gift of wine. It was for special, something special. But it's something that we become dependent on weekly or daily. And that's just one example of sin. There's many, many different... You, there, I'm just using a couple of easy, vivid pictures here. But we, there's just one example. We turn to sin to meet a need. But like drugs, the sin we turn to, just like the drug, really is killing us physically and spiritually. That's what it's doing. There's many sins. Gluttony is a good example. Gluttony. Eating too much or eating too much of something. Right? That's, that would be gluttony. But we use it to fill a void in our life. Lust. Why do people turn to lust? So many turn to porn because of a need they want to meet. Well, my spouse isn't meeting my need or, or God's not making sure my needs are met here. So we, so we turn to, to, a, to a sinful behavior. But why do we really turn to sin to meet our needs? Because we're broken. We turn to sin to meet our needs because we're broken. Every one of us is broken. We're vulnerable. We're vulnerable. Every one of us is vulnerable to something. And many of us, many things, right? But we're vulnerable because we're broken. And so we turn to something wrong to fix that brokenness, which ends up hurting us even more instead of healing us. It hurts us more instead of healing us. That's why I call it love and other drugs. That's why I call this love and other drugs. That's, that's why you see someone who's a, this wife with this beautiful family and, and, and everything's going great and all of a sudden she has some shocking affair, does some shocking thing. And, and it baffles everybody, but why? And, but if you if you get to the bottom of it, you realize that that woman needs affirmation because of a wound in her life. And so she's turned to sinful behavior to meet that need. I'm just giving you an easy example. Uh, but we, all, we, all, we all know what I'm talking about. That's why a husband becomes a sex addict. He, he's learned to soothe his stress with sexual sin. Now we know God created sex and making love for a husband and wife to achieve intimacy. But, but what happens is if someone learns to use it to, to soothe and to release stress through the sexual release, it, it's that sin and, and it and ends up destroying intimacy. But that's because we're broken and because we're vulnerable. And it's, it's all a lie. I'm using just a couple examples. There's hundreds of them, right? It's all a lie. All sin is a lie. Anything against God's word is a lie. I don't care what the media says. I don't care what people say about it. You know, whatever. They, they will excuse any sin today, right? But it's a lie. We must come to Jesus to get our healing. 
We can, must come to Jesus to get our healing. John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Anything that is against God's word is a lie from someone who wants to destroy me. Remember that. Jesus wants to give us full life. He wants to give us something that will fulfill us. And it can only come through Jesus. Now next week I'm going to talk about how to break these lies. Don't miss next week. We're going to talk about how to break these lies and live the full life that Jesus Christ wants us to have. That he came to die on a cross so that we could have. So that he came and rose from the dead to, pr- to break the power of sin and, and give us real life. That he, he came to give us this. Don't miss this. It's the vital conclusion. But first... We have to understand, and this is today, we have to understand what sin is, and we have to trust God on this, and we have to make up our minds to obey God and to repent of sin, to say, God, I I repent of it, I, I turn away from it. No matter how I feel, no matter how vulnerable I am, no matter how damaged I am, no matter what the the strongholds are in my life, I have to make up my mind to obey God and surrender my life to Jesus. Because God will do everything anything to help us. God's grace is there for anything at any time in our life. It's there. All the grace in the world is available to us. God will do anything for us except one thing. He won't make up our mind. We, he will not make up our minds for us. We have to surrender to God. And what we decide will impact the rest of our lives And all of eternity. In fact, in Galatians 6, verses 7 to 8, you'll see what I'm talking about. It will impact the rest of our lives and all of eternity. Where he says here, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please the sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. How is God speaking to us today? How is he speaking to us? Have you ever surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? Have you ever put your faith in Jesus? No matter what sin you've struggled with, or don't struggle with, Whatever sin in our life, it can be forgiven. Anything that we do or have done can be forgiven. That's why Jesus came and died on the cross for us. So that we could be forgiven. John 3.16. I know I'm in a rut. You're going to hear it every Sunday. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Life. God loved us so much. He wanted to set us free. He sent his only son, Jesus. Abraham, Isaac, you've been here the last couple of weeks. You know what I'm talking about. His only son, Jesus, to die on a cross in our place to take our punishment. But he didn't just die. He rose again from the dead to prove he was a son of God. To give us a brand new life. That whoever believes in him, if we will put our faith in him, our trust in him, if we will give our life to him, surrender our life to him, We can have eternal life and it starts the moment we give our life to Jesus. We have a brand new fulfilling life from that moment throughout all of eternity. Through faith. Have you ever put your faith in Jesus? And if you have, those of us who are already Christians, are we living in victory? Are we living in victory? Or have we been deceived by sin, fallen in love with sin? Are we putting sin to work in some way, trying to make it pay? Are we ready to, to are we, are we, are, or are we living in victory? How are we vulnerable? How are we vulnerable? Are we ready to break the lie in our life? It takes a prayer of repentance. And that's why we're preparing this. This week I just want to encourage you to just say, God, I'm going to obey you. 
I'm going to repent of this sin. I want to be free of this. I, I, just take this week of, of, of preparation that, God, I'm going to obey your word. I'm going to trust you. Show me why I'm vulnerable. Show me where I'm wounded and broken. Help me. Begin to heal me. And don't miss next week. We're going to go th- look at what the Bible says about getting that healing that we need. Let's go to prayer. How is God speaking to us? As always, we have a prayer team that's here to pray during the prayer time, during the song, worship, during, afterward, hanging out and praying. Anybody ever needs prayer, just come on up. There's lots of people here to pray. They totally understand because we're all broken. We're all wounded. We're all vulnerable. We need each other. Confess your sins one to another. How is God speaking to us this morning? Are we living in victory? Or is there a wolverine following us that we need help killing it? Would our prayer this week be, God, I'm going to I'm going to obey your word. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to obey you. If you hold to my teaching, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Father, if, I, if we hold to it, show us the truth. Show us where we're, why we're vulnerable, where that wound is. Help me. Heal me. Father, I pray that each person here could, could find their freedom and their healing and victory and joy and peace. Even, even if someone has given up hope, Lord, that you would give us hope today. And while we're praying about that, maybe you're here today and you've never put your faith in Jesus. You've never surrendered your life to him. You've never turned to to Jesus for salvation. But that's the first step. The first step is putting your faith in Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Have you ever believed in Jesus? It's not an intellectual assent. It's a belief that is in the heart. You can do that right now. A prayer of salvation. It's a simple prayer. God, I repent of my sin. I ask you to forgive me. Because I'm putting my faith in Jesus. who died for me, who came back to life for me. I put my faith in him. I give my life to Jesus. If you have prayed that prayer of faith and something radical has happened... Sin has been broken. Your old life has been been put to death. The Spirit of God is now living inside of you. You're in for the shock of your life. He's living inside of you, and your life will never be the same. You now have the power to fight. You now have the power to live the life God wants, has always wanted you to live, the, the life he created us to live. 
He is now your heavenly Father. You've entered into an amazing love relationship with the one true God through his son Jesus. If you have put your faith in Jesus, I want to encourage you to let somebody know. Maybe you came with a friend or family member. Maybe you fill out the card on the bulletin, stick it in the box, or you tell me on the way out, or text, email, call. Let, let, let me know. Let somebody know so that we can encourage you and be excited for you. Father, I pray that you would use this week to prepare us. Open our eyes through your Holy Spirit. Prepare us. Open our eyes to our, our wounds and our weaknesses, our vulnerabilities, our, our disobediences. Prepare us to break free and to live free. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.